Welcome. In a world of crisis after crisis, where one half of the planet is, is immersed in terrorism, desperation, poverty, and the other immersing itself in immorality, greed, corruption, choking the life out of a, a once paradisial world, we end up asking ourselves, how will this all come to an end? Where, where are we going? What, what is the destiny of mankind? To help us answer these questions, we have with us in the studio today, Mr. Dev Ramcharan, and we're going to look at the gospel, good news for the 21st century. Welcome, Dev. Thanks for having me. We are going to consider what the Bible has in store for mankind today with a, a great hope that is, we are in so desperate in need of. And I guess we can begin some of these questions with, Dev, has God's plan failed? You know, Peter, it might look to some people that way. In the difficulty and the challenges that we see in the world around us, there's always that sense that God is not involved. Uh, there are some people that even believe that there is no God, period. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice in the first image that we have on screen, there's, there's a picture of the earth in God's hands. And when we were children, back in the 70s, back in the 60s, we would hear a song that was sung by Mahalia Jackson. And in it, she said, he's got the whole world in his hands. Oh, and why is that important for us? It's important for us because it gives us the sense that no matter how crazy things may get in our world, no matter how much it looks as if human life is unwinding on the planet, God actually is in control. Has God failed? Have the things that he said he's going to do fail to actually come to pass? And is there some kind of sense that these things are not going to occur? And the answer to that question is no. Very good. So is there something that uh, we can look at that shows that, and, and let's make comparisons, let's be fair, we have to really show the state of the world, what we're like, and then show the alternative message of hope. Mm -hmm. What is this world like now? Well, you know, when we ask ourselves the question, what, what kind of world is this? Um, it is a world where there are a lot of tears all around the earth mm -hmm. in countries everywhere. It's a world that is full, not of good news, but of bad news. Every time we open the newspaper or we look at a news app or we check uh, the, the, what the radio programs are saying with respect to the condition of the world, we hear about things like devastating climate change is affecting people all around the world and is, 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 is devastating lives around the planet. We hear about things like tsunamis, there's economic meltdown. We're right now in the middle of, a, of, a, of an economic recession that started in 2008 and has, is, has not yet fully resolved itself. And we're faced with the devastating possibility that there will be further and more extensive economic impacts that could affect the whole world. We have natural disasters, an increase in earthquakes. We've got epidemics worldwide. Uh, we, we remember SARS from a few years back. The AIDS epidemic continues apace all around the world and has devastated the African continent. Many, many people have lost their lives. There are many grandparents that are raising children who will never know their parents because they've died as a consequence yes. of AIDS. We've seen war everywhere, all around the planet. We live in an age of terrorism. 911 has burned itself into our consciousness, and we will never forget 
what happened at that time. And it continues to plague us even today as we look at the things that are happening with ISIS, ISIL, yes. whatever we want, yes. we want to call that kind of extremism. And we see not uh, an increase in economic stability and in a standard of living for people worldwide. What we actually see is a deepening crisis of poverty for many, many people and a, a growing gap between those that are wealthy and those that are poor. So that's our world today. It's a world in which it's very clear to us that mankind does not have the answers to the problems that we face. Well, it's apparent that uh, nothing really has changed in the past several thousand years, that there's a disparity even within our own city that's very affluent. You still see the, the very rich in, on the same street as the very poor. You see those with uh, expensive cars and those that are homeless. So the, the very difference between the haves and the have-nots are found within the same picture. What I noticed from that uh, slide you presented, there are problems in the world that man cannot help, mm -hmm. that are issues of whether natural disaster or others that are caused by man. It looks like we're going to need to hear some good news soon. Yes, well, in the midst of all this bad news, it just seems to get worse and worse and worse as the years go by. There is, in fact, the good news that is available to us in the Bible. Now, the word gospel, which most people know, actually means glad tidings or good news. So, right in the word itself that is used for the message of the New Testament, which is built on the message of the Old Testament, one integrated message, there is the indication that God has good news and by us we would infer that he recognizes that what we are continually surrounded by is bad news. So there is good news in the gospel, in God's word, the Bible. In other words, you're, you're saying that we're not going to find the good news in today's headlines. No, we're not. Well, the, uh, the hope of Scripture has been laid out for a very, very long time, has it not? This isn't just uh, an overnight sensation. This isn't just a tabloid message. This is something that has far-reaching history and far-reaching impact into the future, even to today and beyond. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that uh, you could relate to the past where the, this good news was being taught? Mm. Mm. Well, there was definitely news that was being taught in uh, times in the past as far as Scripture is concerned. We have the early records of Genesis. We have the, the, uh, the record of the life of Noah and his family, for instance, yes. um, where a message was being preached in, in the circumstance of, uh, of, uh, of, of a world that had not yet seen rain, at least the way that we see it right. today. Uh, a massive structure was being built. Um, for the saving of lives. Uh, animals, all kinds of animals were on that particular uh, vessel and Noah and his family were the only human beings that entered the vessel. And the, the implied uh, uh, you know, a meaning of that story is that people aren't always willing to listen to what God is trying to tell them. So Moses, or, or Noah for 120 years, builds this vessel no one listens. No one cares to listen. And then when the time comes for that door to be shut and the rains came, then people who had not responded, who had paid no heed to God, who had no respect for him, found themselves on the outside of the vessel and having to contend with the horror of destruction that everyone had to face at that particular time. So that was a time where a message was being preached, where an opportunity for salvation was available and people ignored it, disrespected it, and just didn't take advantage of it. So, so the good news uh, was not uh, gift-wrapped in any type of uh, indifferent, uh, just tabloid news, as we said. It, it was presented with an appeal, but at the mm -hmm. same time, a warning. Good news never comes as any type of uh, apathetic uh, text message. That's right. There's no, there's no text messaging. From God. We don't get an email. He doesn't whisper into our ears and tell us to do this or do that. Um, there's a message in the scripture, and we have the chance to respond to it or not. Um, when, if you were to ask the question, for instance, well, what is the gospel? Um, we talked about earlier what it means. Um, there's a passage in Acts chapter 8 at verse 12 where 
um, one of the disciples, Philip, is preaching in a territory called Samaria, outside of the area that was inhabited by the Jewish people at that point in time. And it says he was preaching uh, Jesus. He was preaching the gospel yes. effectively. And it, it, it tells us in a few words what the content of the gospel actually is. And it's the things which concern the kingdom of God. So there's a kingdom that's a part of that message, right. as well as the name Jesus Christ. You know what it says, the name. So that means that there's some meaning associated with Jesus and, which, uh, and Christ, which would, which would give hope to mankind. It's part of the good news. So that's what the gospel would consist of. It's the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name Jesus Christ. What then, we're begging the question, uh, what does Jesus Christ really mean? Okay, you might be surprised to know that, uh, that uh, many people don't know what those two names actually mean. Um, one is his name, and one is a title. Now, the name Jesus actually means God saves, or God is saving, right? Yes. And Christ means an anointed one, someone who's been anointed. In Israel's history, in the time of the Old Testament kings, kings and priests were anointed with oil. Right. It was a symbolic act. It indicated that well, God was pouring his power upon this individual who had been chosen, selected by him to do work that he had given them to do. Kings had work to do. They had to lead. They were involved in governance. Uh, they had to make uh, uh, legal uh, jurisprudence uh, choices or decisions affecting the population. And the priests, well, they had a continual work that they did likewise in caring for the people and teaching the people. So these were two types of individuals, at least. There were others, but these in particular who were anointed with oil. So the names then, when you put them together, Jesus and Christ, really form a, a thematic message which runs throughout Scripture, runs throughout the Bible, uh, runs throughout the Gospel message. And that is, God is saving through someone who is a king priest. The king priest is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ was and is. In his life, in the work that he did, in the sacrifice that he offered, he officiated as a priest doing God's will and offering a sacrifice which was himself in complete obedience to God. But he will be the king of the earth. Yes. And that is something that yes. is part of the, the kingdom aspect, right? So the name Jesus Christ has that wonderful meaning to it. It's God is saving through an anointed one who will be king, priest in the earth. And one would think uh, with the, uh, the plethora of uh, secular writings, that, and I've noticed this myself, and uh, one tends to observe that there's often uh, throughout history messianic figures or uh, pseudo-Christs. There, there's always been some kind of facsimile that tries to promote a figure to fill that in. Mm -hmm. There's something within mankind that has always wanted to, oh, we're going to come up with this type of super man persona that really never fits the bill of, as you're talking about, Jesus Christ as king and priest. Mm -hmm. So when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was given this initiation of the anointing by God, there, there would have been certain requirements and characteristics that he had. One of them, I'm sure, being that he had to not only conquer the world in a, a non-violent uh, way, but he had, to, he had to conquer himself as well and do some very uh, difficult things that most people wouldn't volunteer for. Mm -hmm. what, what is it about the Lord Jesus Christ that sets him apart from every other human? Well, what a great question. And that is that there have been heroic figures throughout mankind's history, um, people who other people believed in and sought some sort of refuge from or salvation from. But none of these individuals, no matter how great the personality was or how, how powerfully charismatic the individual might have been, um, however earth uh, shattering the historical events were that they were at the heart of, not a single one of these individuals uh, was a source through whom 
manki mankind uh, was going to be saved because every one of them sinned. Every one of them, in spite of yes. the wonderful work that the individual might have done. And you think of all these people, Abraham Lincoln, Gandhi, etc., 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 all the way through. These were individuals who were afflicted with sin. They were flawed. They were faulty. They were fragile and inconsistent in how they actually lived and behaved in the lives that they had on the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ was a perfect sacrifice, Scripture tells us. He was sinless. Now, we talked about the fact that mankind has to be saved, that God is yes. saving uh, through this individual who is anointed, who is a king priest. And you might ask yourself the question, well, what do people need to be saved from? What do I need to be saved from? What does modern man and woman in materialistic and prosperous Canada need to be saved from? If you're working, you've got a house, you've got one or two cars to drive, you're well clothed, lots to eat, etc., etc. We need to be saved from sin. And we need to be saved from death. Because every one of us is dying. From the moment that we arrive you know, from our mother's womb, we are now a dying mortal creature. And we're all faced with death. We need, to be, we need to be saved from that. But what else is there that we need to be saved from? Illness, hunger, all the depredations and the horrors of war, the violence that seems to be in every country, in every city, in every town, in every school yes. in the world, uh, the, the terrible injustice that occurs throughout the world all around the world, where those that are poor and oppressed have no voice, but are under the heels of those who are powerful, in whose hands the capacity for violence is great. All the tragedies, all the grief that we face through the losses and the experience of life that we have, all of that is stuff that we need to be saved from. John 3.16, which is perhaps the most, the most well-known verse in all mm. of Scripture, uh, says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that doesn't mean that if we believe in Christ we, we're not going to die. That's not what it means. Right. It means that we will not die without hope. Yes. Right? We fall asleep and that's it. Everything ends for us until the day of the resurrection and the judgment from the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to be saved from all of these things. And if we reflect in our lives, it doesn't matter how prosperous you are, at that moment in time, one day, every one of us will be faced with these realities that we've just talked through regarding pain, yes. death, and all that we have inherited as human beings on the earth. You know, the, the image that uh, you chose to portray up on the screen of a, of a lone, uh, solitary figure, you know, crucified without uh, the benefit of even a fair trial and lonely, uh, isolated, suffering and, and under shame and uh, contempt. It was like all of the weight of the world was upon his shoulders. The, 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 the suffering, the humiliation and the absolute pain of that type of sacrifice. It doesn't seem that history could ever have produced of its own from mankind and conjured up this idea that we're going to save ourselves if one person volunteers to go through the agony of uh, whipping and beating and ultimate the torture of, of crucifixion. I think this concept could have only been devised by the Almighty. And so when we look at uh, this idea that God and Jesus are um, working together to save mankind, you answered the first question is to, to be saved from what? Because a lot of people who have it all materially mm -hmm are not looking to be saved. Yes. And so this uh, continued thought of yeah. salvation, what is it that, uh, what, what are some of the things that God says, I will do this for you? What are some of those things that God, God will do? You know, Peter, God is saving us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that are willing to respond to him. What is he willing to do for us? God forgives our sins. He gives us the hope of eternal life, something we don't deserve and never could deserve. And he does it through the love that he has for humanity. 
He also changes our thinking. If our worldview shifts away from all the ugliness and despair that people experience today to something that involves hope at its core, then that changes how we think, how we view life. The, it's, our, it's a different set of filters that we actually operate with as we engage with each other and with people around us in the world in which we're living. Through baptism, we enter into the family of God. Right? Now let's go to a passage. There's, a, there's a, a passage of scripture that is useful to us. We won't look at the whole thing, but we'll look at some of it. And that's Romans chapter 6. And in Romans chapter 6, we read the following words, beginning, beginning at verse 3. Paul writes, Know ye not, don't you know, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Okay, so this is right off the bat, we've got a principle that is quite profound. And that is that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, which happened over 2,000 years ago, is not something out there far off in the distance in ancient times that I'm not connected to. It's a very mm -hmm. personal thing for every one of us. When we're baptized, there's a symbolic association between you as the individual who's being baptized and Christ. You talked about the fact that there he was outside of Jerusalem on a cross and he was, cruci he was crucified. He, he, he died in this most horrendous way. Well, when we go down into that water fully and are fully immersed in baptism, symbolically we're saying, this me that exists and who I am, what I deserve is death. And I'm associating myself with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I come back up out of the water, it's to a new principle of life. I'm now going to live a life trying my best to follow after the Lord, even though I will never achieve it fully. I'll never get it right. But my new life is going to be a life in which hope is founded on following in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so verse 5 says, if we have been planted together, if we've been put down into the water together, in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. So what that means is this. Christ was resurrected from the dead. He came out of the tomb. And likewise, we have that hope of resurrection to eternal life, to receive eternal life after the judgment, when we are resurrected. But also, when we come out of the water of baptism, the waters of baptism, we're resurrected to a new way of living. And that new way of living can only be understood by adults, which is why adults are baptized in the New Testament. Wasn't the Lord Jesus baptized himself? He himself was baptized. So you might say to yourself, you know, I don't need his baptism stuff. I'm a Christian and I believe the Bible. Why should I be baptized? Well, Jesus himself was baptized. So it does establish an example of humility so that we comply with these things as Scripture indicates. Now, I think uh, you may have something there up on the screen that uh, actually shows an image of uh, a reenactment of the Lord Jesus Christ himself yeah. being baptized, which if he were to lead us, would lead by example as well, and not just words, but he did by deed. Mm -hmm. Is there any other place uh, in Scripture uh, that shows a parallel example of that salvation uh, is so pertaining to God's specific commands that there were there other requirements uh, even in the Old Testament that showed God says you need to do this to be saved mm. in our pa final two minutes that we have left yeah there were many but the one that we'll go to is the one we talked about earlier which is uh, Noah and the uh, the message that he preached yes. and the ark that he built over a hundred year period 120 year period um, people had the opportunity to go into that ark and be saved or the alternative which was to find themselves in a most uh, awful situation um, with respect to, uh, to their life on the earth, which ended quite abruptly when the rains began to fall. Yes. So we have a hope that Christ will return. I understand that uh, Scripture has made it very clear that he will return, that he will return in a specific time and place. Do we know anything about 
the place that he will return to. Yes. So we're given a number of passages, and there are a few that are on screen right now. Um, but the one that tells us particularly where he's going to uh, show himself to the world um, is in Zechariah chapter 14 and verses 1 to 4 in the Old Testament of all places. So we would think, some people think, you get rid of the Old Testament, you only believe the New Testament. The New Testament is founded upon, integrated with, and is an expansion on what is in the Old Testament. Christ is going to return to the Mount of Olives, which is outside of Jerusalem, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the land of Israel. Right? And at that time, he's going to establish his kingdom. A kingdom which is described in Psalm 72, uh, verses 1 to 19, as a place in which peace will reign, justice will reign, and there will no longer be any hunger, any of the evil and terrible things that happen in the world. So our association with that kingdom and the joys of uh, what Psalm 72 is uh, showing us has to come through adult immersion. Yes, it does. And a life that we, we do our best to live, which is aligned with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when, will he, when will he come back to the earth? Luke 21 tells us in a time of great turmoil. So we're living in those days right now, Peter. But these are also days of good news if we will reach out to God and take on that good news message of the gospel. Well, I know... Uh the last slide said, we, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, of the, the power of God, and we recommend everyone to please continue searching the scriptures daily, for in them we have life. Thank you for listening.